Good afternoon, dear ARISET viewers from around the world. Today's program has a special guest from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Yafit Mahari, to ARISET, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Ya 
اب تقبل كت منزل عيب خالي قلب بقى خايز وخرق سنوية لاي لاي سنوية لاي لاي سنوية لاي لاي عبقو فايتا زي بلو ما ماليس كعت برتق عبقي عنا بلو خا انسب انا تبك عرقي خايم بو بزاي حرانا مسكن فلي يعني كايم نحاي لخاز عقتو فوت امكم زي اللي So today we will be discussing the protests at the Eritrean Festival, mainly in Canada, but also all over the world, and the overall current situation in Eritrea. But before we start, please introduce yourself, your background, and upbringing and educational history. Um, so yeah, my name is Yafet. Like you said, uh, I grew up in Toronto, and uh, I've been here the majority of my life. Um, I am currently in school for trades, so I am planning to be, uh, I do construction, but I am planning to do something more um, specific. So I'm in between electrical and plumbing. Um, but uh, yeah, I graduated high school and just doing what everybody else is doing. Okay, that's good, that's good. So uh, before we begin with the rest of the questions, I just want, uh, I just want people to understand the intent of this video before it goes out. So following the protests at the Eritrean festivals, many of the youth and other older people were quite confused as to why there were protesters. And yes. so it seems that a lot of people in the diaspora community are oblivious to the harsh realities in Eritrea. So hopefully we can clarify any questions that these people may have. So starting off with some background, how would you describe the current situation of Eritrea, especially for young people? Um, I think the only word I can use to describe it is horrible. I think it's um, it's unjust. I think it's unfair. Um, uh, they, the thing with, in my opinion, I think mm -hmm. uh, a lot of youth in Eritrea are missing basic necessities, basic, basic, like down basic yeah. like running water <laughs> yeah very basic things you know and um again i do think it's uh it's unfair i think it's uh, unjust because as um myself being a young person um i would want the people in air cheer to have the same opportunities that i have basic things like going to school and being able to choose what i want to do in my career simple simple things like that that they don't have the choice um, I saw an uh, air TV interview where Isas was saying that we have some of the worst education in the world and he thinks it's sad, but he controls the education, right? So yeah. he, he closed down the only university in Eritrea and us for us. So you can't be, you can't, you can't complain about our education not being good enough or there not being enough um, people who are doing things when you haven't given them the, the platform to do that. Which is a lot of, one of the reasons why everybody is starting to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The situation is quite sad. So, uh, on topic of Eritrea, have you ever visited, or do you have any memories of Eritrea? Uh, I did go when in two thousand and two. It was a long time ago. Uh, long, long, long time ago. Um, uh, my mom went in two thousand nineteen. Um, but yeah, no, I've never been recent. Recently, I've never been. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not because it's not because I can't, but it's also I am scared of going. Mm 
because I do speak out a lot on the internet and I do speak out a lot in um, social settings. Mm -hmm. So I'm scared. Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. So uh, I also did visit back in 2018. So <laughs> I understand the feeling. Uh, when I went uh, as a tourist, you know, I hear a lot about like, you know, people that go back home from like America or like Europe. They're like, oh, it's great over there, you know? They talk about like, you know, how they enjoyed it, but it's quite the opposite when you see how the people are living. Because I mean, as a tourist, you go there with a lot of money and mm -hmm. you have access to what normal people there wouldn't have. Anywhere, access. anywhere is fun if you have money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So uh, it's definitely sad. And I remember back when I went in 2018, like I left when I was two years old, as I was like two and a half years old. But when I went, they were like trying to stop me from leaving. You know, they were like, oh, how did you leave Eritrea? How did you, you know, get out? And it was like, so really, it was a really long process just to come back to America. So yeah, I, I definitely understand the the fear that's the there. The fear, right? Just to, yeah. just that of one, I just avoid that. Yeah, not being able to visit your home country and stuff. Which sucks because, you know, like <laughs> there's a lot of things that I do want to see. I want to see my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. I want you know my my aunts and uncles and cousins and stuff that I don't even know, but yeah. again that is the reality of what the country is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, many young people who grew up in the diaspora communities they support the regime or they're just ignorant to the entire situation and don't care. So what is it or who influenced you to oppose the current government? Well. Me personally, I grew up in a family full of the auntie. My whole family, I, like my dad's side of my family, they're all Shabia, they're all uh, supporters of the government. And but I didn't grow up with them. I grew up with my mom, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, her side of the family has a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my aunt is very, very active in the community. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've probably seen her. If I told you her name, you probably know who it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I did grow up around a lot of influential people who kind of, honestly, even, I feel like even if I didn't grow up around them, it's just common sense, you know? If you choose to ignore it, that's on you. Um, I know a lot of people who say, yeah, um, I know Eritrea is bad, but it's not my problem. Or I know Eritrea is going, I know people in Eritrea are struggling, but I go there every two years for a vacation, so I don't care. Right. So it does depend on the person. Yeah. But, you know, those views are kind of selfish because Absolutely. like even like even if you were to put like as an air train, if you were to put yourself in the citizens positions like the people back home, you know, you wouldn't have the same views that you have here in like a, a free country. Right. You know? So, yeah. So, uh you were at the the protest with Brigade Nahamadou and yeah. you who protested at the Toronto Festival this past weekend. So can you give us can you give our viewers the full picture about what occurred at the demonstration and the subsequent events? Um, well, when we all first had gathered, it was um, there was we, there was a conversation about violence and aggression and w the direct conversation was we don't touch anybody our goal is not to hurt people our goal is to get a message across so again which is why when we went i <laughs> me personally i had a bag of t-shirts that's it that's all i went there i had a bag of t-shirts to give out or you know if anybody wanted t-shirts they can come okay. to me i just went with t-shirts some people went with signs other people went with flags but there was no, there was no intention to go and start beating people up. There was no intention to go and, um, you know, create chaos or violence or anything. But the second we got there, and this was the most shocking part for me because I have never in my life have experienced this kind of hate from my own people. Mm -hmm. When we got there, I had women my mom's age screaming at me calling me Adame, yeah. calling me all kinds of stuff. And I'm just like, yo, what is going on right now? Like, yeah. you know, like I was just, it was just a lot for me personally coming from an environment where I've never experienced that 
from another air chain. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, and then yeah, it's it's just it, it. I feel like it was unavoidable. It was yeah. unavoidable. The the fighting was unavoidable. Um, again, we didn't go there to start fighting people. We didn't go there to start swearing at people. It was completely unavoidable. Um, the second we got there, again, like I told you, we were met with um, cursing and there was ladies throwing bada bada at us. And yeah, it was... <laughs> all going on right now. Um, there was people on... So the way the park is set up, there's a gazebo in the middle mm -hmm. and there is older men like beating us or trying to hit us with the sticks from the flags. Mm -hmm. um, and once we got to the tents... Oh, it just all hell broke loose. Oh, yeah. And I've like I've heard a lot of people talking about uh, like the PFDJ and like their supporters and people. They were claiming how you guys were all like being violence toward children, women, elderly people. I was actually reading an article by the Guardian, and they were they they had uh, they interviewed somebody from the Air Train Festival, like an attendee. And they were talking about how you left all the el uh, how all the elderly were left for the dead, and there was just the most extreme allegations and things like that. So, I mean, what do you have to say against that, that type of allegations? That really, genuinely, it hurts my feelings. Not even that it hurts my feelings; it just hurts because it's like you know that's not what happened. I know that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what interview you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what interview you're talking about. Me and her, we both know that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just sucks that when you know you can you can spew things to social media and make and and to news networks and make things work for you. Mm -hmm. If you are willing to do that, then it's sad. Again, not if it, there was it was reported nine people injured. Ninety percent of the injuries were from us. Mm -hmm. I think maybe two or three of the festival goers were injured and they're all men. Mm -hmm. Not a single woman was touched. Mm -hmm. Not a single child was touched. Not, it was just, it was just men. Yeah. It was just men. Yeah. <laughs> not that it's right, not that it's mm -hmm. wrong, mm -hmm. but again, if you come, as a man, if you come and hit me, I'm going to defend myself. Mm -hmm. It's common sense. It's, 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 it's just simple yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it just hurts because, um, as somebody who grew up here, and that interview, the person who did that interview, as somebody who also grew up here, you know better. Yeah, yeah. So me personally, I didn't go to any protest because of like, like you know, fear of violence or whatever it was. But I did like I was, you know, keeping updated with the situation, especially the one in Seattle. Yeah. And it seemed like. Uh, like in Seattle, for example, the protesters, they went at like 4 a.m. just so like they could avoid the violence, you know, that was like the entire goal to avoid the violence. And I, I just remember like I like my like a couple of the protesters, even though they went at like 4 a.m., they still ended up getting hit by some of the officers there as well. And so uh, it's just like the violence is like, you know, it was really unnecessary in my opinion. Absolutely, I agree. We even, if anything, we were late. The initial plan was to go early, early in the morning mm -hmm. because, again, nobody's goal is to hurt anybody. It's just so the mm -hmm. festival doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Our goal was so that festival does not happen. Our goal, I'm, I'm not going to beat up old people. Yeah. That is not my goal. <laughs> I'm extremely respectful of my elders. I'm mm -hmm. extremely respectful of my community. My goal was not there, was not to go there and start beating kids up or start beating up old women. The goal was for festival not to happen. We know what it means. We know what festival stands for. Um, I had a lot of my friends, I had a lot of people my age message me and be like, yo, what's wrong with you? Da, 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 da. Yeah. If you can sit in a park, you can sit in a hotel and dance and eat when people back home are dying, when people back home are crying, when our mothers are crying, then you are an animal to me. You're not a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because... Clear, so the issue is not violence, because you guys don't mind when violence happens in Eritrea. You guys don't mind when violence happens to people fleeing Eritrea. You guys don't mind when these boats are drowning. 
Mm-hmm. But you guys are you guys mind when violence is hap- when you guys don't like it when there's violence that's ruining your dancing that's ruining your eating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's one sided. Yeah, yeah. It's quite hypocritical. I I also saw uh I saw a video from Vanessa actually the Vanessa Tahaya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she's yeah. great. She's great. Yeah, yeah. I saw how she spoke out about the same exact topic about how people were like people were so hypocritical to condemn like the violence that occurred at the protest but then they turn a blind eye to the actual the actual violence that happens in Eritrea and not that this is like condoning the violence at all but like you know no you pick and choose you pick and choose when you want to be upset yeah yeah you pick and choose that's what it is that's really what that's really what they're all about they pick and choose when they want to be upset about things yeah so you mentioned some friends like texting you and stuff so has your have your opinions and your stance on the situation affected any of your relationships? Yeah, quite a bit. Quite a bit. Um, um, I've had um, maybe three, four people be like, "Yo, I can't talk to you anymore." You know, like you guys are terrorists. You guys is. I was like, "Whoa, terrorists!" Is like, that's such that was a far reach to call us terrorists. Yeah. But what? they do back home what they've been doing back home for the last 30 years is not seen as terrorism mm-hmm. what we did for one day for two days isn't seen as terrorism mm-hmm. so again it's more or less i don't feel like i've lost anything i actually feel like i'm gaining um because now i get to see what people's real intentions are now i get to see where people's heads are actually at mm-hmm. you know? um so i don't think i I'm not I'm not at a loss of, at all if anything i gained because um, throughout the couple of days of us protesting and stuff, I met a lot of great people. I met a lot of people who who have been directly, who have directly struggled, mm-hmm. who, are, who have directly suffered. And um, I've gotten a lot of insight from them. Yeah, yeah. Which is bigger than anything I can receive from anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Definitely agree. And so uh, back to the topic of the violence that occurred. Uh, it wasn't really clear, but who incited, like, the, like, what incited the violence to even start? Like, was it? The second we got to, like, so, the, um, the area to get to the gazebo was fenced up because that's where their DJ is. That's where there's, you know, whatever, the performance is, whatever, um, mm-hmm. the park. So it's fenced up. The second we got to the fence, um, I have a video, but somebody took a stick and hit the fence from their side. And then these guys just lifted up the fence and said, then just started marching in. From then, that was it. Oh. The and they touched one of the tents and one mm-hmm. the fences, it was just game over from then. Then everyone just, um, the festival goers or whoever, the organizers who were inside the tents started hitting us with sticks. And <laughs> you know, there's a video um, of a couple guys in blue shirts going into the trees and grabbing branches. As and it just, I'm just saying this to show that we came with literally nothing. Mm-hmm. That the fact that these guys felt like they had to go and grab branches to protect themselves mm-hmm. shows that we came with nothing. These guys had metal poles. Somebody had a knife. Um, yeah. There was rocks. They had rocks covered, so you couldn't tell it was rocks. We even we when the police did show up, we did tell them and they did confiscate all that. Mm-hmm. But again, it doesn't say that in any of the news articles that came out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, during the protest, there's actually, in addition to an uh, interview you did, there's actually a viral picture that's been going around. It's been posted on The Guardian and CBC News. And it's a picture where you're standing face to face with these, like the line of police officers. So tell us about the picture because it looks like you were really passionately talking to them. Oh, I was... um. In that moment, I don't know what the hell I was thinking, mm-hmm. because um, out of frustration, somebody on one of the loudspeakers said, we're going to go in, regardless of what these guys say, regardless of what happens, regardless, is another like, it does not matter, we're going to go in. Mm-hmm. And me, uh, being a, a bit more level-headed than a lot of people, mm-hmm. um, decided to see because these guys pulled out their batons they're ready to start beating people they're ready to start tasing they're ready to start pepper spraying um because again these are riot police they're not regular police they're just here they are specifically for riots and public order they're not regular police because 
They have no leniency. They have no tolerance. Um, the second they see a big crowd moving in, that's it. Mm-hmm. They they will start arresting people. They will start hitting people. They will start severely injuring people. Mm-hmm. So my goal in that point in 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 my this picture was um, to try to kind of de-escalate. Yeah. Because again, a lot of these guys don't speak good English. Mm-hmm. So and the police are just gonna see them as. Uh, um, just you know, just guys who are starting a riot. They don't care what's coming out of their mouth. Mm-hmm. So in that moment, um, my idea was just to keep them separated, saying, like you know, if there's anybody who can tell these guys to back up, it's gonna be me. You guys, dog, showing them sticks, it's not gonna scare them. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying, you know, like in taking now, telling everybody to move back, guys, please, please, please. Like I'm talking to the police. I'm talking. To, I'm like just going back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't regret doing it at all because. At the end of the day, people being arrested, people messing up their papers, people losing their freedom does not do anything for our cause. Mm-hmm. It does nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and these guys, they have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hurt. A lot of, um, they've made a lot of sacrifices. They've seen a lot of things, which is what fuels these decisions. Mm-hmm. I haven't gone through any of that. So I can say and be like, okay, guys, wait. But they don't think like that because mm-hmm. they went through these things personally. Yeah. You know, when they see when they see um, people, there's a lot of people, festival goers, well, this is at the hotel, but there's a lot of people who bought tickets to go to the hotel and they had the option to go underground to go in. Who chose to go upstairs and walk past these guys and show them flags and say swear words at them and cuss them out to provoke? Mm-hmm. So when you when you know when you're in situations like that, these guys are not thinking about police. They're just thinking like, oh, look, these guys are provoking us. Mm-hmm. Well, no, you know, like it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So it was it was a really intense moment. It was extremely intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you talk about how like the protesters they had a lot of trauma too, but something that's always been on my mind is how like even government supporters like a lot of them they they also went through a lot of trauma like those were the very same people that had to you know ask for asylum saying that you know isas is a dictator that they're being persecuted in their country and then they go back they come here and then they celebrate him so it's definitely uh it's really you know that was one of the things um one of uh, a great lady great 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 lady alim she was one of the organizers. Um, I got to speak with her a lot. I learned a lot from her. Um, that was one of the things that she was saying on the speaker is that you guys come here, you seek asylum, you cry about how bad your country is, you come here as refugees, and then you go back on vacation every year. Yeah. And you come here every summer and you dance and you celebrate and you, you mm-hmm. there's pictures of ECS. You guys are kissing pictures of ECS. What is that? Yeah. You guys said you were oppressed, right? It's not showing me oppression. Mm-hmm. And what it comes down to is a lot of them come here, they abuse the Canadian system, they go on welfare, they get housing, they pay little to no rent, and they keep all this money so they can go back home and build houses and do this and do that. Yeah. I know a lady who went back home and she has a, she has unlimited electricity because her house has solar panels. How did you afford to do that? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. It's 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 the hypocrisy. It's just a, a crazy. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. So, uh, back to back to this picture. Were you were you able to de-escalate the situation? Were you afraid of the police? No. You know, I- no. In that moment, no. Oh. In that moment, my only concern was that because at that point, I think two people had already been arrested, mm-hmm. and again. People getting arrested, people getting hurt, does nothing for the cause. It does nothing. If anything, we're losing. Mm-hmm. Um, so at that point, and I did, um, one of I did build a, a little bit of a report with one of the sergeants there. So when I told him, like, yo, I got it, you know, he gave me um, the benefit of the doubt, and um, he did tell them to just obviously you have your batons ready to go, but don't hit anyone yet. Yeah. See what this guy can do. If he can do it, okay, fine. If not start beating them up <laughs> oh, yeah 
Yeah, I think what you did, it, it probably stopped a lot, a lot of violence. It, it could have been, been way worse. Yeah, yeah. It could have been way, way, way worse. And I, you know what? I don't, I don't blame these guys at all. When these guys are saying, "Yo, go in, go in, guys, we don't care," I don't blame them at all. And anybody else could look at that and be like, "Oh, that's so unreasonable. That's so..." Blah, blah, blah. I don't blame them. I really don't. Mm-hmm. I don't. Their blood is boiling. Yeah. I could never in a million years imagine what these guys have been through. Mm-hmm. I grew up here. You know. I could, I couldn't even get close to what these guys have been through. So when they do things, irrational things like that, I don't blame them at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, the objectives of the demonstration were just to like, you know, shut down the festival, you know, and to stop whatever, whatever political propaganda is spread within these festivals. And so do you think you guys succeeded in achieving this goal and mission? In a way, I mean, and this is the first time this has happened in Toronto. First yeah. time in 30 plus years mm-hmm. that the city revoked the permit. That in itself is a big win for us. Big, big, big win. Another thing that I think we got a big win is, is media coverage. For three days, all the news channels in Ontario we're running this. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing that we needed from these protests was people to know what's yeah. going on. Half mm-hmm. of the police officers that were there when I was communicating, they're like, bro, I don't even know what's going on. I don't even know what Eritrea is. This gave us a chance to educate people. Mm-hmm. That's what we need the most. I don't need another Eritrea knowing what Eritrea struggle. It's not going to do anything for me. I need other people knowing what's going on. The way everybody knows what's going on in Ukraine, I need people to know what's going on in Eritrea. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. the same thing. Mm-hmm. Media coverage is so important. Mm-hmm. Public perception is so important. And I feel like now finally we're getting to a point because of these demonstrations mm-hmm. um, that we're slowly getting there. Yeah. And that's a big win for me. They had their party at the hotel. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I don't mind that because mm-hmm. I'm celebrating other wins. You know, yeah. Um, maybe next year they won't get the hotel. Yeah. You know, I'm not. I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, but these past 30, 30 years, as you've mentioned, nobody like these festivals have been going on, and there's hardly been any media coverage on Eritrea, even though, you know, these organizations such as the UN, you know, Human Rights Watch, they're well aware of what's going on. But mm. you know, when Russia and Ukraine they had their war, it was the biggest thing ever, right? But when Eritrea, you know, is suffering, there's hardly any, like, coverage. Nobody talks about it. Why do you think that is? I don't want to... It could be... I mean, from a logical standpoint, it could definitely be a race issue. Mm-hmm. A lot of the issues that happen in Africa are overlooked because mm-hmm. maybe, we are, maybe we're black. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, we're African. Nobody really cares too much. Mm-hmm. <coughs> when a white person um, struggles it's um, more important to the rest of the world. Or it could simply be misinformation. The air chair has no Wi-Fi, no free press, no nothing. So um, there are certain people who are educated enough to know what's going on who or who want to educate themselves. But there's a lot of people who, are, who just don't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think both of them are major reasons. Uh, there was a study that talked about what how race plays a factor and you know how the world reacts and because you know east africa you know that region it's always in a like state of constant like struggle mm-hmm. and stability problems are often over overlooked you know because people are like oh it's just going on again you know it's like what what can we do Ethiopia is literally the freaking cover of um one dollar a day they just think we're starving you know no one really cares <laughs> like it's like you know, when i tell people I've had so many people be like, oh, where are you from? Like, Eritrea, where is that? I'm like, next to Ethiopia. Oh, are you guys starving? I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's just, people are just, you know, like they have, there's a stereotypical idea of what's going on in the East and mm-hmm. that's what he really cares past that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think it probably has a lot to do, again, with misinformation because there's like, there's so many factions about like what people think, you know, there's supporters and then there's people that don't support. So when it comes to, people who aren't Eritrean, they don't know what to like listen to, you know, who do they believe? 
Right. And okay, so uh, again, going on about like the contrast between the protesters and the people who attended the festivals, it's quite vivid. So um, how can you describe the people who support and even celebrate the Eritrean government? Listen, me up until maybe the last three years, maybe the last, let's say the last time I went to Eritrean Festival was like maybe the year before COVID. I used to go every year. I used to go every year. I used to play soccer. I used to do everything. Because the way this is advertised to people my age is that this is a way for us to connect with our people. Mm -hmm. As an 18 year old, I'm not 18 now, but I was 18 then, you know? Like, as an 18, as a 17 year old, as a 16 year old, I'm like, oh, this is great. I get to meet more people that look like me. I get to meet more people that speak my language, you know? Um, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes as a teenager. Yeah. I don't know who's funding this. I don't know who's organizing this. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know the behind the scenes. And which is what, the, and I feel like that's a big part of why a lot of these um, youth support it. They don't even know what they're supporting. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people my age be like, yo, you know, this is just a cultural festival, fam. This is just what we do to, to so that I can go see um, other Eritreans. Mm -hmm. I think the exact same way. Mm -hmm. You know, even being from a family of Domti, I st would still go. Because I used to be, um, nobody can take away from me my pride as an Eritrean. I love being Eritrean. Yeah. I love my country. I love my people. I love Bahle. I love everything about Eritrea. You know, nobody can take that away from me. But I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to lie. And I'm not going to live in a fairy tale world. And that's what a lot of them are doing. Because it's the easy way out. It's easier to sit and go to festival and have a flag and ring it around and be all good with your parents and be all good with the rest of the community than it is to speak out and tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Which is what I noticed with a lot of these guys. Because I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with some of the festival goers. And they've willingly admitted to me that, yeah, Eritrea is bad. Eritrea is not good. I wish it was better. But then you turn around and go to the festival. So I already know where your head's at. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue with a lot of them. A lot of them don't want to take the time. Um, a lot of them don't want to take on the stress of speaking the truth. Yeah. And I think a problem is that, like... Uh, I've seen a lot of people who speak out, you know, on social media platforms, and all of a sudden they're being they're being told that they're not Eritrean anymore, that they don't love their country. So I know this happened. This has probably happened to you. How do you feel? Happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, like, that's yeah, you, the yeah. only thing that they have to say to me is that oh you're Agame or you're mm -hmm. from Tigray oh you're Wayane or you're this and that. That is the only thing that you can say to me. You have nothing. Nothing that you say to me has depth. Mm -hmm. Nothing that you say to me has anything about my. You can't. You can't say anything about my character. You can only call me Agami. That's all you have. Mm -hmm. And even if I, what the hell is Agami, bro? What is that? You know, I need. I need them to come up with something better. Yeah, yeah. My dad's from Qatar. My mom's from Saganiti. I'm pure blood Eritrean. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Nothing you say to me will bother me. I, like, I've said this to so many people. I've had a lot of people be like, yo, you're not even real Eritrean. You're Ethiopian. You're Because I'm speaking out about my, because I'm speaking the truth. I'm not from Eritrea. You guys need to come up with something better than that. Yeah. I've had a lot of people in my family call me and be like, yo, how can you support a group that supports Tigray? You know what Tigray did to us? You know what TPL lifted to us? You know what Wayan did to us? Why should I punish a group of people for something Melas did 20 years ago? Yeah. Our Tigray, there's a Tigray genocide going on. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with Melas. It has nothing to do with what happened in 98. Yeah. It has, it's just human right, basic human rights. Yeah. So if you guys, as a community, think that, oh, Begin Ahmadu supports Tigray, they don't care for Eritrea, you're then there's something missing in here. Mm -hmm. If you as a person, as a human being, can support the genocide of innocent people, then there's something wrong with you. Yeah. It's that simple. Nothing you say to me will bother me. Because I I speak the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you put that into 
you put that very like perfectly because it's they've been referring to you know agame you're from tigray as like you know an insult and it's really not they're just a group of people you know a great group of people at that yeah yeah who are very strong in their culture Mm -hmm. they're very strong in their being yeah it's so horrible that they're being attacked the way that they're being attacked but it just shows what kind of power they hold yeah yeah in my opinion yeah yeah for sure so uh back to the situation in eritrea it's been referred referred to as the north korea of africa you know it has the number one offender of human rights with no basic constitutional rights you know ranging from like freedom of speech religion petition you name it they probably don't have it and you know it's ranked number two in slavery index as well so how is it that people in the diaspora community that enjoy the freedom and rights of a free and democratic country go on to support such a repressive and undemocratic regime. Ignorance. You know? Simple ignorance. Yeah. It takes a quick Google search to go see what's going on in Eritrea. Very, mm-hmm. very quick Google search. BBC will tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. You know? Um, a very quick Google search will tell you. Every single article written by white journalists that I've read has called Eritrea the North Korea of Africa. It's called the, one of the most repressive governments in the world. This is all information that's on the internet. Yeah. So if you want to educate yourself, you can. Mm-hmm. People who don't are is just complete ignorance. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to be again, this is about living in a fairy tale world. What's easier for me as an individual? Mm-hmm. The easy way out is to go dance with my bandera and you know, do what everybody else is doing. The hard way is to speak the truth. Mm-hmm. People who speak the truth will always be condemned, no matter what. It's that simple. Yeah. And I I think you, okay, so in the Seattle, I think it was, it was in the Seattle uh, protest, uh, there's a man, his name was Captain. Captain, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> yeah. And he was speaking to a bunch of, I think it was like about a group of like six or seven. I saw the video. Yeah, the video, right? And he was telling them how like they shouldn't even have to listen to him because they could just get an unbiased perspective just from a simple Google search, you know? And how people shouldn't be blinded by the people around them. They shouldn't be scared, you know, just because that's what their parents believe in or that's what their friends believe in. Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely think that's something for all the youth and the diaspora community. But it's just, hey, look, be fresh. Y'all, y'all fresh. This they is want a- the same dream you do, but they trying to tell you, hey bro, my mom's here. <laughs> I know the brother went to Sawa and went into the ground and had nothing to do with us. We got nothing to do with you. We got nothing to do with Ethiopia. Why our brothers got to go down in Ethiopia? It's not our business. Right? We will if y'all want together do some fun stuff um, and also speak about what's going on, I would love to do that. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of the, I want the, I think the biggest thing for Eritrean youth is the togetherness. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, that's what they're seeking. They're seeking to be together with people from their community, whether it's right or wrong, mm-hmm. right? So, which is one of the reasons, which I personally, I think well, that's why it's so easy to pull them in. Cause they're just looking for, there's in, in Toronto, specifically in Toronto, there's a lot of multicultural diversity and all these cultures have their own huge communities. There's like, there's little India and there's Chinatown and there's this and that. And all these people have their own communities where they can be together and where they can do things together, you know? And um, I think if, you know, us as Ta'amti could start something for youth to educate them, that would be a beautiful thing. Yeah. And that's something that I do want to look into into the future. Because um, these pro, you know, pro-government people have all these youth groups. Mm-hmm. you know yeah. which is how they roll people in they have like paint nights and they do barbecues and they do this and that and it's specifically for Eritrean youth so we could do that on our end and um, you know speak the truth mm-hmm. I think it would make a huge difference in how much um, youth we have in our group yeah yeah. Been- I think what he's doing is amazing yeah, yeah, because the youth do put, do have a big part, especially in the future. Yeah. You know, can't be the same. Like, you know, people grow up. I always say that. 
I always say that. I always say that. I say that to my mom. I say that to my aunts and uncles. Eritra is for us. Mm-hmm. You guys, you're going to pass away. You're going to leave. You're going to get old. And Eritra is going to be for us. Mm-hmm. So if you want us to take care of Eritra, yeah. then we need to be educated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would love to go back home and live there. Mm-hmm. I would love to do that. I really would. So on the topic of youth, um, I'm 17. So that means this is my summer before senior year. So I spent like the entire summer, you know, I've been like researching what college do I want to go to? You know, um, what's my major going to be? Things like that. But, you know, the reality in Eritrea is quite different. You know, at the same time, I'm over here preparing, you know, my, my college applications. The 17 year olds back in Eritrea, they're getting ready to go to Sawa, you know where they're going to be, where they're, um, where if they don't get satisfactory grade, they're going to be doing military service for the Lord knows how long. That's so, I said to mm-hmm. the TP24 interviewer, I told them if I was 17, if I was in grade 11 right now, yeah. grade 12, I would be in the military. That's yeah. Yeah. It. So it's, mm-hmm. it's amazing that you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. And so it's why we see such large like we've seen emigration you know all those boats that drown in like the mediterranean red sea it's all because they're it's the youth that are trying to escape you know because they have no futures in eritrea so how do you feel about the lives of the eritrean youth i want them i want them to be i want them to have the opportunities that i have I've seen, I saw so many people posting those pictures, those Lampedusa pictures of the the little coffins and stuff. You wouldn't even take back their bodies. You wouldn't even take their bodies back. How can you support something like that? And then go post RIP. He wouldn't even take back their bodies. He said they're not Eritreans. How can you support that? Little babies, teenagers who just want better for themselves. I get to wake up every day. I get to take the bus. I get to go to school. I get to walk around. I get to, I can talk back to a police officer here. <laughs> you know, simple, simple things that they don't have. It's the simplest things. I have running water. You know, my electricity doesn't turn off for eight hours of the day. I'm able to, the same way that you said, you're, you're sitting down, you spent your summer sitting down. Picking what college you want to go to. Picking what program you want to do. I want them to have that. Whether it's in Canada, whether it's in the States, whether it's in Eritrea. I just want them to have equal opportunity. Eritrea economically is so rich. There's so much things to do. There's so many jobs that could be occupied by citizens of the country. Not by Chinese people. Not by Russians, not by anybody, but by Eritreans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eritreans are the only people who can take Eritrea forward, in my opinion. Eritreans are smart. The you, some of these guys that that come here within a year, they have cars, they have jobs, they have houses. Yeah. So it's not like they're stupid, or it's not like they're lacking anything. Mm-hmm. They just haven't been given the opportunity or the platform to grow to their full potential. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know people who have lived here for years and they don't have some of the things that these newcomers have. Because mm-hmm. yeah. they know. As long as, if you give, it's like, it's, it's simple. Like, you know, like, I, I plant a seed, I water it every day, I make sure it gets sunlight and it'll grow. That's it. That's it. The yeah. rhetoric is so simple. Yeah. Eritrean youth, they want the opportunity. They want to grow. They're not lazy. And this is why they're fleeing. If I'm willing to die, if I'm willing to leave my country and die just so that I can get a chance at something, I don't even know what's waiting for me there. But just the idea of it, if I'm willing to lose my life for that, then clearly something is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Common sense. Uh, you talked a little about uh, like earlier. Uh, you talked a little bit about Isas, talking about how 
you know, the country was doing bad, like academically, you know, <laughs> education wise education wise so why has he kept the same policies for like the past 32 years the thing might you know the thing that makes me i think the thing about isas that i really like is that he is honest yeah he's honest he tells you to his, to your face i'm ruining your country and these guys are just so deep in la la land that they they're refusing to listen he's telling you himself mm -hmm. our education is so low yeah. why is it low you're the president. You tell me why it's low. Why are you asking us? You know, simple things. He's telling you on national television. Mm -hmm. And you guys still, you know, they still choose to ignore it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, as a Canadian citizen, can go and vote. Not for my, not forget, forget my prime minister. I can go vote for the simplest thing, city councilor. Who's the councilor of my area? I can go vote for that. Why shouldn't we, as a people, have the opportunity to vote who's going to run our country? ECS started off as a war hero. I, I, can't, I will not take that away from him. No matter where he came from, a lot of people say he came from Tigray, a lot of people say he, he was sent by Haile Selassie. A lot of, there's a lot of, you know, is it true, is it not true? I don't know. I can never take away from the fact that he is a war hero. But you take that and you are supposed to help our country flourish. You're supposed to make our country a better place. Instead, you took our country like a little piece of paper, crumbled it up and put it in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And it's just getting stale and old and it's sitting in your pocket. You're not doing anything with it. Yeah. Air show 30 years ago was the same and it's the same now. If anything, it's worse. I was not the same person 10 years ago. You know, I developed a lot in the last 10 years. The mm -hmm. same way that I feel like Eritrea should have developed. Mm -hmm. Eritrea is a country that deserves so much more. It deserves, it really deserves its flowers. It deserves so much more. It's seen so much mm -hmm. as a country, as a people. Yeah. Every country, every family, every Eritrean family that I know lost somebody has a suwu in their family. Every single family that I know, what did they die for? What did they die for? Yeah. They died for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like he's spinning on their graves right now. He's spitting on their sacrifice. Yeah. It, it pisses me off. It really does. It, it yeah. genuinely angers me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think that was all the questions I had prepared for you today. But before we wrap up today's program, what message do you have for the youth back in Eritrea and also here in the diaspora? Change is coming. Change is coming, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. It's coming and it's coming fast. You as a people cannot ignore that this happened in four, five, six cities all over the world. You can't ignore that. Yeah. We're not lying. Even if, let's say it was just Toronto. Maybe you could say, okay, these guys are all liars. Everybody in Germany is a liar. Everybody in Seattle is a liar. Everybody in Sweden is a liar. You know? Change is coming, and it's coming fast. These guys are pissed. Their blood is boiling, and they're coming for it. They're coming for change. No matter how it comes, no matter how which way they get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. So, and, mm -hmm. Yeah. Either you know you can get your head straight and um, accept the reality of what our country is and what it's going to become, or you can stay in the land. Up to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really up to you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, right before you leave, sorry, uh, you. There is a lot of media coverage again on like, you know, the festival, the protests. So uh, you were again interviewed by a news outlet. So we'll quickly, we'll quickly play a clip. Okay. The idea was for us to go and walk, march there and have a peaceful demonstration. 
And when we got there, we were met with sticks and rocks and somebody had a knife and they had metal poles and they were hitting us from the gazebo. And from there, it just went out of control. What was the gathering about yesterday before you got there? What did you understand it to be? It's advertised as a cultural Eritrean festival, but in actuality, it's, um, it's, in, it's, how they, it's how they collect proceeds and funds to send back home to, to fund wars and to fund uh, child soldiers and to fund jails and to fund all kinds of illegal things. So what's going on at the Sheridan Center today? So tonight they're going to have uh, a private party where they sell tickets and the same thing, the pros proceeds go back home where there's an imposed 2% diaspora tax for everyone living outside of Eritrea. So you pay this tax to the government as an act of solidarity with the dictatorship. How much money are we talking about roughly that you're thousands, saying it, thousands, thousands. are accusing? Yeah, so this video is how I first like saw you, you know, I just scrolling on my TikTok. The video is going viral. I've had so many people send it to me. Yeah, yeah. And so, I'm very glad. I'm extremely glad. I don't want people to say, hey, you know, you shouldn't have put your face out there like that. I'm so glad I did. Yeah. I have yeah. no regrets. I'll do it again. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I would do it again. You know, I I just I it's really, 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 really I'm really happy that a lot of people got to see it. Um at the end of it I did mention that again we're fighting for human rights. That's it. We are fighting for our human rights, we're fighting for other people's human rights, but we are fighting for basic human rights. Before anybody tries to twist what Bhagavan Hamadu is or the Amti, what they stand for, before anybody tries to twist what it is, we are standing for human rights. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I've had people come up to me and say, you know, why are you getting involved in politics, you know? And it's it's like, you know, Eritrea hasn't reached a stage where it's even at politics, you know? It's just Isa's. So the entire, like, all this protesting, all this speaking out, it's just, you know, for basic human rights, the, the same freedoms that you and I enjoy, it should be accessible to them, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad you did this interview. It was, it's, it's really important to reach the youth and especially since a lot of like, you know, current affairs or news for Eritrea, it's like in Tigrinya, you know, and a lot right. of the youth here may not understand it. So uh, you speaking out at the, that then for the um and doing the interview was really it was really uh it was really something good thank you yeah that's the goal i will try to be the captain of toronto <laughs> <laughs> so. okay so thank you for thank having you. me again no problem and thank you so much for being here and thank you to all the airset viewers who have stayed and watched and uh, yeah thank you okay Oh, <laughs> 